All right. So I'm putting together a presentation about uh, containers, and I'm doing this for um, work, but I figured that, uh, you know, why not do a practice run and, uh, you know, kind of share this with the rest of uh, everybody else, because, uh, you know, why not? I know a lot about this topic, so um, this is a presentation about, you know, introducing containers in Docker, and uh, eventually OpenShift makes its way into this picture too, but um, I haven't really gotten there yet, so... Um, we'll go see where we get, we get though. Um, and this presentation is not complete, so there's going to be some things on this introductory slide that um, I don't have in this presentation yet. Um, start off uh, talking a little bit about virtual machines, um, and then venture into the clouds, and then you know enter into containers, and then talk about Docker, and then this thing called container orchestration, which I'll talk about, and then. Um, uh, there would be a slide about container platforms, but it wasn't done yet, so it's not in here. And uh, I'm not really going to do a demo today because there's other pr present uh, other videos I've done that have demos in them. And normally there would be questions and answers, but this is a video, and you can't ask any me any question. Well, you can. You can ask me questions in the comments if you would like. All right. So virtual machines. All right. So virtual machines have been around for a really long time. Um, and originally, of course, I said the 90s, and then, you know, some of the people that I work with said, no, 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 sir, we've had, you know, virtual machines all the way back in the mainframe days. And so I was like, okay, yeah, that's probably true. And uh, so, you know, really the idea, though, of a virtual machine is just to run programs that were developed, um, you know, for one set of hardware um, and then run them on another one. Um, and most of us, you know, that you know, where we remember virtual machines for the first time is when they hit, you know, the, the consumer market in the early 90s, like virtual PC, which was a, you know, really awesome thing. And all of a sudden now you could run Linux on Windows and you could run Windows on the Mac. And then other ones, you know, started popping up. And all of a sudden we had all these virtual machine, you know, providers. And it's, you know, but really exciting. And, um, virtual machines actually solved a lot of problems that we had in software development like you could run different machine configurations without changing the hardware you could take a virtual machine image and just run it in lots of different places and um, you can even now build virtual machines out of templates so um, you can basically just hand somebody a little file they run it through a tool called vagrant and then suddenly bam they have a virtual machine so you can literally have OpenShift running just from a Vagrant file. Mach virtual machines are, are actually optimized, so you can run a whole bunch of them on you know the same physical hardware, and this actually is a huge benefit to large corporations and, 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 and such, because now you can go to a model where instead of having to you know buy physical machines every time you want to host a new application, you just kind of allocate a virtual slice of a, a server you already have so you can get these applications up and running much much faster and uh, because of all of this even commercial services started popping up that allowed you to just spin up machines you know on the fly in the cloud and even though the cloud is kind of the new you know buzzword clouds have been around for a really long time and um, uh, you know things like Azure and Amazon and iCloud and Google and everybody, all these people have clouds now, and you know they're all a lot of these are running in virtual machines. So, or they yeah they spin up virtual machines. So, cloud terminology. So, um, you know as as all these services kind of popped up and and now the cloud kind of came around. Um, there's some terms that kind of came out of that. Um, you know and. These cloud offerings, as you'll find out there, they kind of fall into three different categories. So, um, and so a lot of us have heard of this, you know, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. But what is the real difference between all of these things? Well, we can use an analogy to um, better understand these categories. That's right, pizza as a service. So here's, here's a diagram of, of different ways of, you know, eating pizza or, you know, cooking pizza and all that. So in the traditional way, back in the days when my great-great-grandfather was cooking pizzas, no, I don't know. He, but anyway, you would, you know, basically get all the ingredients together, make them in your kitchen, put them in the oven. You know, you would you'd bake it, and then you would, you know, um, take it out and you'd, you know, eat it at home, right? And then, uh, you know, 
infrastructure as a service is kind of like where somebody else is providing the ingredients. You know, you still cook it at home and, and, uh, and you know, and actually I realize, well, that, uh, never mind. So anyway, um, they provide the ingredients, you cook it and serve it at home. Uh, platform as a service. So they provide the ingredients, they cook it, but you still serve it at home. And then software as a service, they provide the ingredients, cook it for you, and you eat at their location. So, you know what? I did actually have a different diagram, so the wording this, that I'm using don't quite match up. I, I realize now that uh, you know my analogy and my picture don't quite match up, so I'm gonna have to fix that. So ignore that, but, um, but here's the thing. You aren't making pizzas. You're building solutions for your users. So you're not typically you know, providing infrastructure yourself. Every time you go and want to host an allocation, you don't go to Best Buy and buy a machine and buy a rack and, and put it together, right? You, you, um, you go to somebody and say, hey, I need some machine, and they, they kind of do the stuff, and you know, they, go, they go, great, here's a machine, go crazy. Right, you you install your own OS on it, libraries, data, etc. Right, or you know they do that for you. You know you say I just need you know um, you know JBoss server, and so they provide that to you, and then all you do is you provide the code and the data that goes on it, or um, you go to an application where it's all built for you. You know you have something that there's already an existing solution, and you just say I need one of those, right? And it kind of looks like this, right? So there's different layers that you manage. Um, so, so what are containers? So containers are kind of the next iteration of the virtual machine cloud model. Um, so when you look into a virtual machine, it consists of many layers. And um, you, know, you have the application layer up on top, which is the code that you provide. There's some binary libraries, you know, there's always dependencies that you're, you're kind of running against. There's a guest operating system. So, you know, if you're running like a Linux application and you, you're trying to run it in virtual machine on Windows, right, you need that Linux layer. Then there's a thing called the hypervisor and it's a hardware or software layer um, that, you know, manages the guest operating system. And, um, you know, there's, there's kind of been a transition from, you know, software uh, hypervisors to more hardware hypervisors because they, they're faster and, and stuff like that. So now there's hypervisor technology built into the motherboard. Um, there still is software, you know, that goes on to it too. But the idea of the hypervisor is it's basically managing that guest operating system and kind of translating, you know, system calls in the guest operating system down into the host operating system. Then you have that host operating system layer and then you obviously have the physical server that it's running on, right? So containers are, are very similar to that, but instead of, you know, um, running on a guest operating system, they're leveraging the host operating system. So um, instead of that, you know, guest OS and hypervisor, um, it contains a current, you know, a, a container engine and it leverages the kernel of the host operating system. So similar kind of picture, application, binary layers, but then you have this container engine, and basically every time that those, those lab binaries and libraries are trying to make system calls to open up files and, and write to sockets and things like that, the container engine you know, takes those to the real kernel of the host operating system and uh, you know, does it there. System calls that normally would have been handled by the guest operating system are actually done in the host operating system, but it's still done in a way that's secure and isolated from other processes. Um, Linux containers leverage features that are built into the Linux kernel, like C groups and namespaces. Um, there is also Windows containers now, so they kind of do very similar things. So, um, but containers also offer portability and abstraction. So, um, here's another analogy for you. Um, you know, take a, a standard shipping container, and when I'm talking shipping container, I'm talking like containers for the go on ships and, and buses and train, or not buses, trains, you know, semi trucks, whatever, right? The idea basically being that you have a collection of, you know, related or non related items. You know, you have cars, uh, you know, oil, pianos, whatever. You have all these different kinds of objects, right? And they have to go into a box. You know, and you want to be able to transport all of these random different things, but not care about what's in the box, right? You want the forms of transport and that kind of thing to operate the same way no matter what's in the box, right? So, you know, you pack it, you protect it and package it in a consistent way. You get a container that's the same size, 
right? And then now you have the ease of loading and unloading. You just have to pick up the container and put it wherever you need to. And, uh, you know, the larger that container is, you know, the greater the efficiency of the loading and unloading, right? And it accommodates all these kinds of different transports, right? Ships, trains, trucks, right? So how does that map over to like a software container, right? Well, again, we could have lots of different things. And I know I'm sorry that the, these are really kind of small, but um, there's things like, you know, you got your VM and your QA server and all this down here, right? You have all these different places you want to run your software. And then up at the top, you have like, you know, maybe a stat of a website or a database or a web front end or a, a queuing, you know, server or, you know, some kind of analytics or machine learning stuff, right? You might have all these different things and they, they all have different requirements and they are different sizes and things like that, right? So you still have this collection of kind of independent, you know, technology solutions. And, uh, you know, you want to make sure that they're, you know, tested and structured and secure and great. But you want hardware independent accessibility. You want to be able to run this, you know, on a dev machine. You want to run in a QA server. You want to run it on a, you know, in your data center. You want to run it in the cloud, whatever. And, um, you know, you kind of, you want this just kind of very reusable so that, you know, no matter where you're running this, it always kind of works the same way. And uh, you want it to be, you know, agnostic to like, you know, f uh, front ends and things like that. And you want to make it fast. And, and one of the cool things about containers is that you kind of have this unlimited capacity because, you know, really it's, um, you know, the c you can put as much in the container as you really want to. Um, and they're easily extensible. So, and, you know, continually fresh. So another advantage is that, um, you know, unlike traditional servers where every time, you know, you have to go and, and fix something, you might have to go and run, you know, a bunch of installers independently to update all these different, you know, things. With the container, you just update the container and you're automatically refreshed. So um, Docker in the standard container model. So. Docker is one of the container models that came out, obviously, and it's really helped, you know, to standardize the container model, but it isn't the only one. Um, you know, there's um, other ones like, uh, you know, biggest one is Cloud Foundry and things like that, and uh, garden containers and stuff like that. But um, container images um, in Docker are defined in a simple file that kind of just allows you to de describe what's in the container, right? And containers, images, um, you know, that are defined by Docker files can inherit from other images, which kind of allows you to build really complex containers that are combinations of, you know, simple images. So you kind of layer them up and you get a really complex image. It's open source. Um, you can register your images, you know, and share them with other developers. There's a great developer community. There's great developer tools for it. Um, but there is a new container standard called OCI that is coming out that is trying to consolidate existing container models into kind of a unified standard. So you can, you know, we can have more of a nice ecosystem where, you know, you don't have to, um, cause there are some tools out there where you can take your Docker container and convert it into a garden container and then run it, you know, on Pivotal and things like that. And, you know, it would be so much easier if you just had a common base, you know, technology for running containers, right? So here's kind of the, Docker development flow. Um, you kind of, you know, the first thing you do, of course, is you, you define your image and, uh, and I should say basic um, development flow. There's many ways to actually build an image, but this is the basic way of doing it. Define your image in your Docker file, um, build that image. Um, you know, you give a tag, which is basically a way of giving that image a name so you can refer to it. And then you push it out to a registry and then you pull it down when you want to run it. So you pull, pull that image down from a registry and then you build a container and you run it. And you can do some other things too. You can um, commit it, which is basically if you have a running container, you can basically create a brand new image out of a container that's already running. Um, and then you can also actually archive out, you know, images that are, you know, that you have in two files. And yeah, so, and you can also load these images back in from the archives. So. Um, oh, I said, do we have a slide about container orchestration? So container orchestration, containers are kind of just part of the model though, right? You still have to provide configuration and security and monitoring and administration and all kinds of other things. 
And uh, defining applications that have lots of different containers can kind of get complicated because the thing of it is is that you're not just running typically like a, a JBoss or a Tomcat server. You also have MySQL and you have uh, you have other you know components and they're all interacting together and you know try you can put all those into one container, but then you know you, know, you kind of lose some flexibility and and things like that. So usually, well, you want to split those out into different containers, but then it gets complicated, right? So there can be some some complication there. Um, container apps, you know, should go through you know continuous integration and deployment uh, like traditional apps. So you want to you st you want people to you want to take advantage of the way containers work, but you still want to have your normal development flows, right? Well, there are tools that exist that, that you know that satisfy these other requirements and. Um, you know, uh, big ones like Kubernetes, you know, Docker Swarm, uh, Mesosphere, you know, WeWorks, other things like that have all come, you know, to satisfy these requirements. And that's the end of my presentation that I've done so far. Um, there's a little bit more because I want to talk about, you know, container platforms like OpenShift and things like that, and then do a demo. But, uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty good introdu introduction, and I think this was pretty pretty good first dry run so i hope that that was helpful and uh and uh, come back all right thanks